Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show dot com. The Chris Voss Show dot com. Oh, hey, we're oh. doing a uh, bum, bum, bum. hey, we're doing a uh, new kind of segment we'll be doing on the Chris Voss Show about every two weeks. I'll be joined with my good friend John Nosta, who you see on the screen with me here. We're going to be doing a sub show called Digital Health, and what we're going to be talking about is, geez, wearables and everything else. In fact, John will explain it here in a second what we'll be doing. But John is a top digital health thinker and strategist. He's the founder of Nosta Lab, which is his last name uh, by there, and he has been heard with his voice on CES, Bloomberg, Forbes, South by Southwest. I've known John for a long time. He's very brilliant in the health. Uh, field, and this is going to be a really cool thing to tune into every two weeks. Hi, John. Welcome to hey. the show. How are you? Good to be here. Is this the first time we've ever had you on the Chris Voss show? Uh, we did it live at CES, right? We did something there. Yeah, we did something that then yeah. live CES. So, John, so we're going to be doing this show every two weeks, yep. and uh, between you and I, we're going to sit down and talk about... What are we going to talk about? I don't, I don't have any idea. What you know, look... Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, health is hot, right? I mean, there's Google Glass, there's all sorts of technology. It's all this convergence of science, of medicine coming together. And I think it's an important area that we're going to have to kind of chew on a little bit, understand what the trends are, what the implication of digital health is to the practice of medicine, also just the personal care of individuals, because healthcare is functionally broken. And I think that digital health is going to be one of the channels, one of the conduits to help fix it. So it'll it'll keep our viewers kind of in the know, but I hope it'll also keep our viewers in, in the health, too, if you will. And we're going to be talking about a lot of different uh, stuff that you sent me. You sent me, like, a whole list of wearables, of course. We've got the Google Glass on right now. You and I both have the Google Glass. Uh, what else are we going to be talking about? Well, we're going to talk about, I think we should define what, what this is. You know, everybody knows when you think of Volvo, you think of safe. When mm -hmm. you think of, of digital health, you get hundreds of definitions. And even the thought leaders here are kind of ambiguous as to what it is. It's kind of a bundle of benefits. So let's try to define it. Let's talk about wearables, but what's next? Because my, my, my supposition is that the wearables are going to go away and that these things are going to enter our lives in new and interesting ways. And, and then talk about, like, really cool stuff like nanotechnology that... Yeah changes everything. So it's a lot to talk about today, so we'll just take it one step at a time, and um, maybe we can provoke some of the listeners to, to tweet us, to send in some, some, some questions, and mm -hmm. let's take the hard questions here and help people understand this one step at a time. Yeah, I just posted this to Facebook and posted it to Google+, and so if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put them. If you guys have any questions after the show, you'll see it on YouTube, on the Chris Voss Show YouTube channels. You can post questions and comments there, and we'll try and get to them on the next show. So how about them, Apples? So <clears throat> uh, first our discussion, what should we talk about, John? Well, let's talk about what digital health really means. Mm -hmm. and I think that when you look at all these devices that track your heart rate, that help you take a pill, that determine disease occurrence, let's say uh, some sophisticated devices that actually track the occurrence of early stage cancer. What is it all about? And I think that there's two ways of looking at this, Chris. One is what people want, and two is what the marketplace is driving at. So maybe we can approach it from both angles. Simply put, digital health is about helping us manage our lives with the endpoint of living longer. Now, I get a lot of pushback on that, but I think it's about longevity. I think it's about taking good care of ourselves to detect disease earlier. Well, what does that mean if you detect cancer earlier? It means you won't die of cancer. Detect yeah. heart disease earlier. Manage your hypertension or your diabetes better. So I'm in the camp that this kind of falls into this bucket of longevity, you mm -hmm. know? So mm -hmm. now there's a lot of other things that digital health can do, you know, functional aspects of managing electronic medical records and things like that. But I'm going to put the stake in the ground that what this does is help us live longer, parenthesis, better lives. Now look at the demographics now. Look at, look at the, the, the baby boomers. Look at the, the elderly now who are, you know, is it 60 is the new 70 or is 80 the new 60 or is 90 the new 70? I don't know. But all I hear is that there are a lot of people who, who are old as dirt but are active as heck. And I think that those people want to live well, but want to live, you know, 
a healthy life. So that's number one. Now let's flip it on its on its head. And everybody knows about Google. You know, Google is the big company, the hot word. Everybody likes to talk about Google, Google Glass, Google contact lens, that little lens that measures blood glucose levels that kind of came around. Um, they have a new company called Calico. And what's Calico about? Calico is this mysterious Google company about living longer. So you see it on the corporate world. There's being money put in this. Um, there are a few other guys now um, who are, have just developed, just, just named a new company called Human Longevity. Well, come on. I mean, that says it right there. Craig Ventner, the guy who first sequenced the human genome. Uh, Diamandis and Bob Harari, two big players in the digital health space. What do they do? They build a company called Human Longevity. Well, if that's not a clue on the corporate side, Google Calico with Ray Kurzweil, what we're seeing is this idea of digital health defined in the context of longevity. Now, before, before you jump in, I want to push it even harder because right now we're seeing people who have an artificial knee, an artificial retina, an artificial cochlear implant to help them hear. At some point, people are kind of going to become more artificial than real. And we get into this whole trans human reality, which is really, really freaky. But I, I want to push to one point, and that's this idea of immortality. And immortality is really funky in the context of digital health because we're living longer and longer and longer. Will there be some kind of a convergence where we can upload our consciousness into the, into the cloud and it becomes perhaps less a technological issue and more of a philosophical issue. So I'll, I'll kind of take a breath there, but when we talk about digital health, for me, we talk about broad technological advances that allow us to live richer, better, longer lives that push to, the, to that ethereal goal of immortality. And okay, so maybe we won't get to immortality, but it's going to be an interesting path along that road. So that, that's kind of the digital health perspective. Does that make sense? That is, yeah, that is a broad supervision of where we want to go with digital health and what it's all going to be about. I, I do really, I've always wondered since I was a kid, I'm like, you know, if God really would have been properly efficient, he would have made us with replaceable parts like GM where I could just order, you know, like a lung and have it delivered. Um, and now that they have, they're working on that sort of stuff where they can have replaceable parts, where they can grow tissue in petri dishes and um, all sorts of interesting things. And yeah, technology is going to be interested in how it plays a part with sensors. You know, I think you posted some stuff a while back ago about the pills that you can take now. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's take a step back because you talk about the modular body, mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, my arm wore out, my knee wore out, let's get a new one. Mm -hmm. um, look at Google's modular phone. You know, we all saw that online. You know, if you, your screen breaks, you pop in a new screen. So yeah. I think that stuff, you know, it's all, it all comes from the same thinking. And that's, the, that's one of the magical aspects of digital health. It's that you have this cross-pollination of people who, A, know what they're doing, and B, don't know what the heck they're doing. And, and when you combine them, they come up with stuff they never even thought of. And that, that's important because you got technicians, electrical engineers, um, entrepreneurs, people who have diseases, you know, the citizen scientists coming together with the Eric Topols and, and the Daniel Crafts of the world, the scientists, the rational thinkers meet the emotional thinkers. I didn't want to say irrational thinkers, but mm -hmm. these thinkers and thoughts collide. That's why you're seeing a lot of cool stuff at digital health. That's why you're going to see successes and you can also see a lot of failures. You're going to see people stumble and fall. And when they stumble and fall, the naysayers will be there real fast to say, ah, you screwed up, digital health is some kooky idea. But then you're going to find the people who stumble and fly. And those are the pivotal life-changing moments that we're going to begin to experience. Now, as you said, digital health is defined by a lot of people by a device, by something you wear on your wrist, you know, a Nike Fuel Up basis, that kind of stuff. And those are the, the, the proverbial wearables. Mm -hmm. And that's where it kind of starts. And I think that's, you know, that's nothing new. People have had pedometers for a long time tracking how far they walk. Yeah. Um, you're seeing you know, Google, Samsung move into this kind of wearable sensor, even in the, in the context of a smartphone or as a wearable device. But what I found really interesting about the wearable device is that one of the things that, one of the promises that was held out with the wearables was that it'll help you take your medicine. 
So it'll send you a signal. It'll help do something called compliance because people don't take their medicine. It's a horrible problem. And <laughs> if we could just address that, we could we could make great strides in health. But what I'm finding is people stop wearing their wearable about the same time they stop taking their medicine. In other words, the compliance of the wearables is no good either. They yeah. charge it. They leave it on their nightstand. You know, so there's all sorts of problems with the wearables, which takes us to that to to that movement of, of these other things. Wearables ultimately can become a dermal, where it's a patch, a little skin tattoo, a temporary tattoo, a skin resistor that measures all sorts of cool stuff, steps, body chemistry, blood glucose, all sorts of interesting things. So the wearable might be another advance in the context, I'm sorry, the dermal might be another advance in this context. And and that could be not a full-time thing, like something you wear all the time, like a wristwatch, but let's say you have an infection. You go to the doctor, you get your prescription, and you get a little patch that you wear on the, on the side of your neck or on your arm. And that patch measures if you have a temperature. So it tracks whether or not the drug is working. So before you even know that sensor is monitoring your skin temperature, your body temperature, to see if that's one of the first signs of a new infection emerging. So there's a lot of ways you can tie this together. The other thing is, and as you mentioned it, is this idea of a consumable. And there are lots of companies, Proteus, Proteus Health, for example, makes a pill that you swallow, and it interacts with, your, with, with the acid in your body, and it powers itself automatically. So there's no electrical need through a battery. It's self-contained. and these these um, consumables are real interesting because they could interact potentially with your phone or with that patch mm -hmm. from the wearable that tracks if you took your pill or not. So that's a real interesting thing. And, and one of the one of the classic examples is a virtual colonoscopy. So you know, everyone everyone fears the colonoscopy as an invasive. Is that a home, that a home colonoscopy? Yeah. But here, I guess the interesting thing is it, it, it's okay if you're the first person to use the swallowable pill, but who's the second? That, that's what I want to know. John, so, uh, you know, hey, can you do my virtual colonoscopy? Well, thank I'm... you. <laughs> you, know, you. Did you, you see have... anything in there? No, you're good. You're good. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> and, and, and we touched on something that's real interesting here because this is – it's it's this idea of medicine. You say, can you do a virtual colonoscopy? It's medicine at a distance. We're not necessarily eliminating the doctor, but we're creating this idea of medicine at a distance where you can engage with people, with physicians, with caregivers electronically where you don't really need that kind of traditional office space. So I think when you see the transition from watches, you know, wearables, to dermals, little patch, to consumable, something you eat, all that stuff is going to go away. And what's going to happen ultimately is that these devices, these monitors, these trackers, this um, whole body of technology will be built into how we live, where we live, where we drive. I'll give you an example. Your bathroom will have sensors, and when you look in the mirror, the sensor will measure your heart rate. When you stand on the scale, we already have these things. It'll tell you your weight. It'll tell you your body fat. It'll tell you to shut your mouth. You're eating too much. It'll do all that kind of stuff. But when you brush your teeth, the toothbrush will check for cavities. The, the toothbrush will measure the amount of bacteria in your mouth, which will correspond to a heightened um, risk of heart disease. So there's all sorts of cool stuff. The point is that you won't forget the device. You won't put a patch on. You won't swallow a pill. It will be built into your very existence, so it becomes passive monitoring, and that's real cool. The other example um, I talk a lot about is the idea of a glucose monitor in the steering wheel of your car, and, and wow. this is actually being developed now through Ford and through Medtronic, and the point is, look, here's Ford. You know, what the, what the heck does Ford know about digital health? And then you've got a company like Medtronic, which makes pacemakers and, and, and um, glucose devices. What do they know about cars? But they come together, and that's where the magic happens. So you'll see this sort of passive um, uh, monitoring of physiologic conditions. And, and then if you really want to push even farther, it's the whole emergence of this nanotechnology stuff, where these, these little microsensors will 
measure extraordinarily small aspects of our physiology, of our chemistry, of our pathology, and help us monitor, track, and measure disease in ways that, that we never even thought. So let me ask you this. Let's narrow this down a little bit to something we, you mentioned. Um, we've seen this with cars, with GEICO and different things, where if you volunteer to put a chip in your car to monitor you, they'll give you a lower insurance rate. Right. And I'm sure at some point in the future, we're going to reach that that kind of precipice of ethics and morals and what is right and wrong where, uh, you know, do I get, if if an insurance company can monitor, if I'm taking my pills and, and, and I'm using my monitors, will they be able to give me a lower in, insurance rate? And, of course, do I really want them monitoring that information? <laughs> do they want you, do you want the insurance company monitoring the speed of your car and where you go? Mm. Well, you know, there it is. I, I think that, you know, people flip out about privacy. There, there are two big aspects of privacy when you talk about it. There's personal information like health data, and there's financial information. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody worries about their banking records. The banking records are largely digital. They exist electronically. So, you know, no one's running down the road screaming bloody murder, the murder that their financial records are, are online and mm -hmm. corruptible or, or, you know, you can, you can, you can hack them. But in fact, that whole body of information exists digitally. It's the same thing with health. I think that you will find that you'll be rewarded for appropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. Look, insurance company is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a a roll of the dice. If you so, agree to do something, I'll agree to do something. So let me ask you this. Would you personally, yep. if your insurance in the future came to you, and of course we're talking about this sort of digital age that's coming, yep. And they said, "Look, John, we'll give you you know fifty dollars or hundred dollars off your insurance monthly policy if you you use these sensors that are in this watch, or maybe a sensor that they've they've co-worked with on that's on the market, mm -hmm. and uh, and it will monitor if we if you take your pills on time, it, it can tell if the chemical from the pill is in your system, and uh, everything else will give you fifty dollars off your insurance. Would you do that?" I probably would, but I want to look at it from the other perspective. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to be an advocate for my care. I want to be able to have appropriate incentives. Look at frequent flyer miles. Mm -hmm. Look at all these other incentives that are used. For some reason, there's an incentive for almost everything, but when we get to health, that's sort of sacrosanct. Yeah. You know? And I, I'm, I think that First of all, the data show that incentives work. So if you give people money mm -hmm. to take medicine or to exercise or go to the gym or you provide some kind of incentive, you, you, know, you can be very successful. So I'm not at all worried about that. I think that it's, it's also a, a, a self-continuing sort of phenomenon that once that happens, you get healthier, you build the lifestyle around that, and you actually want to do it. So I'm not, I'm not adverse to that at all. Look, you know, if your kids take... Drivers Ed in high school, they get fifteen percent off their car insurance. The uh, you know I mean it's definitely something that could hopefully help save us in health insurance in the future. Not only between getting on sickness and disease much sooner, and you know cutting off hopefully um, deaths and everything else. And of course, insurance companies will make more money by keeping you alive by getting more monthly premiums out of you. <laughs> Well, you know, the other thing is, you know, you talk about prevention, right? Prevention is almost impossible. You know, the doctor tells you to lose weight. The doctor tells you to go to the gym. The doctor tells you to walk 10,000 steps, you know, so that you stay healthy. Chances are you're not going to do it. However, if you have a heart attack or something really catastrophic happens to you, oftentimes you find yourself in the gym or you find yourself doing something. So prevention is a hard thing to do, and that's... The flip side to that is part of the magic of digital health because what you see is that we can now detect disease earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. So theoretically, we could find the very first cancer cell in your body. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that by using nanosensors and sophisticated technology, we can actually get share a border with prevention. In other words, the way we get to prevention is to get to through early, 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 early detection.
-hmm. like mammography or other or other screens, PSA tests. What they're looking to do is screen for earlier and earlier and earlier prevention. And a lot of times things like mammography that finds lumps in women's breasts, by the time you find something there, it's often fairly advanced. Mm -hmm. you know, by the time you 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 feel a lump in, in, in the abdomen, or by the time there's a gross appearance of disease, there's a big tumor going on. But yeah. if you use digital health and sophisticated technology to measure the slightest changes, you now take prevention to a whole new place. And what prevention actually be, I'm sorry, you take you take yeah, prevention to a whole new place and, and it's real, real interesting. So that's another dimension of how do you get people to stay healthier by earlier and earlier detection. Yeah, and I mean in the future, and this is probably, you know, 30, 20, 30 years away, uh, it would be great if you would have those sensors uh, on your body and, you know, if it sensed a cancer cell, it would emit some sort of chemical that would smack it out yeah, and you wouldn't have to bother couple, going to the doctor. A couple things, Chris. One is they have these bacteria now that have been reprogrammed to attack cancer cells. Mm -hmm. so they're called bacteria bots. So they're half robot, half bacteria. And they're actually mm -hmm. developed now. Another, another um, group at the Scripps um, Institute with Eric Topol is looking at measuring signs of early heart attack. So mm -hmm. what they do is one day you'll get a call on your smartphone and the, and, and the ring will say, hey, John, you're having a heart attack. <laughs> don't worry. No, I don't worry. Make an appointment with your doctor in the next week and have it taken care of. Now, just think about what that means, okay? <laughs> this is technology that is here today in development. So instead of having this urgent ambulance, emergency room, intensive care, extraordinarily high cost uh -huh. and high emotional strain, high concern, you go from this, oh, my God, I'm having a heart attack to, oh, well, I'm having this problem, I'll get it taken care of. So there's all sorts of interesting transitions to a whole different level of care. So think about what that does to humanity as a whole to avoid that heart attack. Think about that, what that does to healthcare costs. Yeah. It changes the whole system. So when we talk about 20, 30 years, I'm saying two to five years where we'll see nano detection, where we'll see all sorts of sophisticated markers, blood chemistries. Now, you know, nobody wants a microchip in their body, right? Everybody freaks out and says, oh my God, the cyborgs are coming. Yeah. But if you have a high risk of heart attack, if you have already had a heart attack, if you have, let's say, you've been treated for cancer and you're in remission, these are the patients who might benefit from some of this more sophisticated or more intrusive, albeit nanotechnology, because they're at such high risk that I think they're willing to take the shot and use this kind of stuff. So, yeah, you know, in putting the, the microchip in your brain freaks a lot of people out. But if you have brain cancer and you've got six months to live and I can do a, a, an aggressive technological intervention, I bet you a lot of people will go for it. Yeah. What would be even better is if you could do like a, a, um, uh, a fat-eating uh, metabolism sort of intervention on people. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's apps, there's devices now, there's wearables that, that tell you what you ate. That yeah. actually track through the skin the metabolites to tell you exactly what the composition, protein, fat, carbs were. Hello, uh, MedLife, an insurance company? Yeah, why are you calling me? Oh, I ate too many Oreo cookies uh, and I should knock it off? Oh, okay. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> Chris, think about what you just did, okay? <laughs> well, hold on. It's uh, an intervention. Uh, Geico? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll try to stop that. I just got a call from Geico. They said I was driving too fast today. Yeah. And my average speed for 10 minutes was 82 miles an hour. Well, there you go. I mean, it's the same thing, you know? MetLife is calling you <laughs> saying that your band that you agree to wear tells you you're eating too many Oreos, that your glucose load is too high, or your fat consumption is off. I, I don't think this is far-fetched, especially for people who are at high risk, you know? No, I know a lot of people who monitor, you know, my mom, every morning she gets up, she checks her blood sugar, mm -hmm. she she makes sure that she understands that there's a direct correlation between what her blood sugar is every morning, and she can go, what did I eat yesterday that's causing this, and then she can go, oh, you know, I ate that, and 
that. And so at least she, she has an educated correlation between what she eats and the results that she's getting and how she so, feels and everything. What else. you just said is that she has an educated correlation. That's sort of a sophisticated way of saying a guess. Mm -hmm. So we can track it much more scientifically to mm -hmm. find out that maybe what's happening with someone like your mom is that there's an associated level of stress, mm -hmm. and that stress impacts insulin, and uh -huh. that insulin relates to eating binges because of emotional issues, like you're sad or depressed, or, or you didn't call her in the evening when you promised. That's a very complex clinical scenario. To arbitrarily say, I, I, I take a glucose measurement of my blood in the morning and somehow have sage-like analysis of my of my prior day is, is, is wrong. So there's mm -hmm. the richness of digital health. And that look, it's big data, right? We always talk about big data. It's context, you know? It's what Scoble yeah. said. So yeah. big data, quantified self, the ability to take all this data and process it in a way that we can kind of put things in context. And the trick is to make it go away, is not to make it labor-intensive, but to become passive, that when you go to the refrigerator and you open the door to the refrigerator, you get a message about what you should eat based upon that profile that you did in your glucose analysis. And the, and the rail on the refrigerator has a sugar glucose sensor. and Because so you, know, you, you had too many cookies locks. today, Chris. It locks. It's it's the door. Going. Go away. <laughs> or they put the scale right in front of the refrigerator. I always wonder why people put it in the bathroom. They should put their scale right in front of their refrigerator. It has little has little lockdown cages that come down yeah, in front yeah. of certain areas of the refrigerator. Yeah. You are not allowed to eat anything in section B. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're gonna see. I mean, a lot of that stuff is kind of kooky, but, <laughs> but I think that, that that's that's part of the whimsical aspect of of sort of the digital health movement that somehow comes into contact with clinical need. You know, we talk about like wearing a Nike Fuel or an Up or all these things, but you know who uses them? Athletes. <laughs> you know, really like jocks who go to the gym. Those are the people who use this stuff. The 60-year-old the overweight hypertensive guy sitting on the couch has no interest in using Basis or Fuel or any of these devices, you know? So how can we put that, that sensor on the couch? or that sensor in the refrigerator, <laughs> or put it in the context of their life, so some, somehow it has a practical application. And that's my whole premise on, on digital health moving from the wearable, to the dermal, to the consumable, to the nothing. To just it exists in the context of your life, whether it be a steering wheel in your car, or whether it be the toothbrush, or the fork. You know, there's, there's a fork now that... Um, actually allows, it measures how many, how fast you're eating, and it tells you to slow down. Serious? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called the HAPI, H-A-P-I fork, F-O-R-K. Uh-huh. And, you know, Gobi, G-O-B-E, is the device that measures um, what you ate and what the protein, uh, nutritional composition, protein, fat, and carb content is. So it's, you know, I mean, this stuff is really interesting. You know, I want to I wanna talk about telemedicine because I think that's probably the coolest and and simplest thing that we can talk about in this whole context of digital health. You know, if you're sick, why would you bother going to an emergency room, which is really bad, go into a medi clinic or go into your doctor? It's such a pain in the neck. What I do when I'm sick, I'll show you right here, is I just go to my app. And, and plug it in. And, and within a minute, I have a doctor on the phone. And, and the one that I'm MD using Live. is uh, MD Live. Uh -huh. And if you, if you sign up through your insurance company, it's a real good deal. If you don't have a doctor, I think it's like $48 to get a doctor visit. And when you register, you build in your, your name, your address, your allergies, your local pharmacy, the telephone number, and they send off a prescription if you need it. But more importantly, what this does is it, it not only treats you if you need to be treated, but it gives you an appropriate medical opinion as to when you might really need to go to the doctor. So it's not only that you're being treated, but you may have a funny pain in your jaw, and you yeah. think about toothache, and you know you call a telemedicine um, organization, and they recognize that that jaw pain is really classic for a heart attack. 
Mm. So they, they don't tell you, oh, we'll call in a prescription for something. They tell you, go get emergency care. So so telemedicine is real interesting because it it's so convenient, it's so cost effective, and you can use it anywhere. So nice. I think that's going to be a big, big move in terms of this. That'll be awesome. That'll be really awesome. Oh, uh, so what's wrong with me? Uh, I need more vodka? Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> that's telebooze. That's a different. Oh, that's telebooze. That's telebooze. Oh, that's telebooze app. Look, at that. that's a whole other business on the side. Tend to use that know. more but often. But look, telemedicine also has teleoptician. I was just writing about that today, where you can actually measure your. I do an eye test online, and they give you your prescription signed by by an eye doctor. Wow. So, tele tele ophthalmology, whatever it's called, teletherapy. We're seeing a lot of you know, <laughs> You know, I know it's funny, but look, if you have if you have panic disorder, if you're seeing a, a therapist for a condition, you can do it via telemedicine, via a chat, where you can do it in your house. You don't have to go out into a waiting room and, and you know, expose yourself to that potential stigma. It's a great opportunity because it's yeah. largely a verbal skill, you know, talking yeah. it's a talking cure. So that's a great opportunity. So there's medicine, there's um there's you know, teletherapy, there's teleoptometry. You're seeing all sorts of, of changes. And what's going to happen is today, if you have an accident, you go to the hospital. Tomorrow, when you have an accident, the hospital goes to you. So all this technology will be miniaturized. And, and the EMT will come up with a scanner and look at you and do an ultrasound scan that they transmit back to a doctor who's off site. And they'll be able to analyze your care and make a care plan before you even leave the scene of the accident. Patients in the intensive care unit now are being tracked using telemonitoring where a physician in another state or even another country gets to engage in the care of that patient when they're not in the hospital and there was a 24 percent reduction in death in that patient population. So you're seeing a lot of really really cool stuff. So I think telemedicine is a functional practical reality that people should really consider. You know, your kid has an earache in the middle of the night what do you want? To do? I mean, it's a real pain in the neck. Do you? Your doctor's not around. The kid's screaming. Well, you know what? You can use telemedicine, but cell scope, a little device you put on the end of a, of, a, of your smartphone, will allow you to look inside your child's ear and send that picture to the doctor. Wow. wow. A live core will allow you to take an EKG with your smartphone, and the physician can look directly at that EKG. Wow. Um, your breast sounds. So there's all sorts of cool stuff going, and it's this medicine at a distance, which is going to make life more comfortable, more convenient, more cost effective. And in the final analysis, you know, that doctor's office is kind of going away. You know, that Thank hospital God. is different. So it's it's a new world, and it's fun stuff. So I look forward to, you know, walking through this every every couple of weeks and uh, keeping people abreast of the technology as a point of interest but also as a point of care because some of these things like telemedicine are here now and can make great great changes in care and convenience. And I think a large part of it probably is coming from our ability to do stuff like what we're doing now where you can web conference and do everything and communicate. I mean I've often said you know why do I need to go there? I can I can teleconference <laughs> or Skype with you um, you know waiting in for two hours in a in a doctor's office uh, you know, I kind of had a vision when you're talking about hospitals and determining who's sick and who's not. I had this vision of like one of those giant TV boards, you know, with like 20 TVs in a security yeah. area, and like the doctors just kind of looking at them all, going, "Yeah, that guy, he, that one right there, he looks really sick. Let's take him first, and then <laughs> this one, you know." <laughs> yeah. Like, and uh, you just you just call in and kind of sit there and. You know, maybe you put your EKG thing in the system. You know, the doctor's looking a whole bunch of me. He's got a computer that sets off alarm as to which one of you is the most effed up. And and uh, he's like, man, we we got to get that guy to the ER room. And this guy is just stupid. Um, and that guy's fine. But yeah, that'd be that would be really cool. You know, my dad's had that thing where he's still having the small heart attacks, the TMIs, I think, or yeah, TIAs. TIAs. Too much information. Uh, the uh, he's been having the TIAs, and I mean, he just he's been having little ones every now and then. And it's really scary because you never know what's going to lead to a big one. And like half the time, they just send him home. They're just like, I just had another TIA. Go home. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, well, like, you know, 
And <laughs> it's like, oh my red God. Flag. You, know, you have to be able to manage that. And, you know, one of the problems with treating people with, 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 with TIAs, with little strokes, with clots, is that it's really hard to monitor the, the balance of blood thinning. Mm -hmm. because you, can't, you can't thin the blood too much because then they have a bleed. If, mm -hmm. if you don't do it enough, then it's subtherapeutic and they're not preventing the clots. So that kind of stuff, there's some drugs out there now that are real horror stories to manage patients. But again, if you could do drug management where they can manage their levels much more tightly, you can have a much, much, much better outcome. Looks like we had Louis Galarza. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, Louis. Um, uh, he's been a follower of mine for a long time, really cool guy. He asked, where can you get all these digital health gadgets? And that's probably a pretty big general question, I guess. Google them maybe, I don't know. Well, I mean, it, it depends what you're looking for because, remember, there's digital fitness, which is kind of like activity trackers. There's digital health, which are kind of like glucose trackers. And then there's digital medicine. So there really are three areas. When we talk about digital health, it's a more complex scenario. Um, Daniel Kraft, at Daniel underscore K-R-A-F-T on Twitter, has a new company that actually puts all these things in one place and you can buy them like Amazon. So they review them and um, it's a real cool opportunity to look at, um, at how you can kind of look at everything and get a perspective as to what you need, what don't you need, do you need altitude detection, do you need positioning, do you need heart rate, do you need skin body temperature, a galvanic response. So I would, I would follow Daniel on Twitter. He leads up Singularity University, uh, uh, a real smart guy. This sounds like something that I need to start doing while I'll start reviewing these products. We've, we've reviewed the Fitbits and some of the other toys that people have given us. Yeah. Uh, I think at South by or CS, someone gave us a special sort of Fitbit unit that kids use and interacts with an app that rewards them for going outside. Yep. It was very cool that way, but it sounds like I need to review more of these products on the Chris Voss Show. I think we can do it. We can, we can have a little, little product segment. We can do it together. Uh, yeah, we should. Uh, I'm going to quit screwing around with cameras and mobile phones. All right, no more mobile phones, people. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, this will be awesome. It will be great to have you on, John, because you have a wealth of knowledge about this. I see some of the technology and, of course, um, uh, where some of it, but you're really knee-deep in this stuff, and so this is going to be a really cool discussion to have every two weeks or sooner. We'll do it whenever yep. you want. In fact, when stuff comes up that's high in the news, we can cover it. So, uh, John, where can they find you on the interwebs? You can find me on uh, at Nostalab, N-O-S-T-A-L-A-B dot com. Now, should I sing that, Chris? I don't know if it's, if that's the way you do it. You can do it if you want. I'll not Let's doing it. your voice there. Uh, Go ahead. Sing it. John Nosta, at John Nosta, J-O-H-N-N-O-S-T-A, on Twitter. Uh, real active on Twitter. Try to push out a lot of information there. So that's probably the great, greatest place to get me. And um, that you can track me back anywhere through those two. Cool. Well, that'd be awesome, and everyone knows where the Chris Voss show is. Because if you don't, you're a loser. Um, the uh, so anyway, we do this every two weeks. This will be the what do we call it? The health, health, digital health, digital health, digital health, digital health uh, segment of the pod, the Chris Voss show podcast. So That's you also see this in iTunes. If you want to catch what you miss, you can go to iTunes probably in the next 24 hours, and it will be up on iTunes. You can watch the full conversation me and John just had there. Thanks to our good friends uh, with the Google Glass, 8Lead.com. It's 8Lead.com. They're sponsors for our Google Glass, and you can see the new beta that's coming out fairly soon. You can go to 8Lead.com and sign up for it, which is really cool. So thanks to them for sponsoring the Chris Foss Show. And, John, I guess we'll sign out here, bud. Until yeah. next time. Talk to you later. All right. Thanks, man. Right. And we'll see you next time.